In this video, I'm going to cover what you need to study for quiz number one. This slide is at the beginning of the PowerPoint and it has a list of the activities that are covered in quiz one. I did make one change, so instead of the standard plate count, I swapped that out. So I took out the standard plate count and instead I put in the capsule stain. And that's because we won't have time to have the review session for the standard plate count until after the quiz. So instead, I put in the, the capsule stain. So these are the activities that you need to review. And I'm going to walk through each of these activities and tell you what you need to know. Notice that for the gram stain, there are two organisms that are listed. Escherichia coli, that would be an example of a gram-negative rod bacteria, or Staphylococcus epidermidis, which would be an example of a gram-positive cocci. So for the gram stain, you should be able to recognize an example organism that would be gram-positive and an example organism that would be gram-negative. For the negative stain, there is another organism that you will need to know. So you will need to know Treponema pallidum. And that Treponema pallidum is a spirochete that is seen using a negative stain and that it causes syphilis. And so you want to know, again, an example organism for the negative stain. So I'm going to walk you through and we're going to look at what do you need to know for each of these activities. So we'll start with microscopy. When you're studying for the microscopy section, you should be able to recognize the various parts of the microscope. And basically, pretty much any of these parts are fair game. You should know the mechanical stage knob, the fine focus, the coarse focus, the light intensity knob, which is also referred to as the rheostat, what is the condenser, where is the iris diaphragm, etc. So you should be able to recognize a picture like this and then to tell me what are the various parts of the microscope. You should also be able to calculate total magnification. And that is that you take your objective magnification times your ocular, that will give you your total magnification. You should also know the names of those four lenses so that the 4X lens is referred to as the scanning lens, the 10X is the low power, the 40X is the high dry, and the 100X is the oil immersion lens. You should understand the basic steps of how to use the microscope. So what are the things that you need to do? Now, notice that there's a part of the microscope that is um, underlined here and bolded. You want to know that the nose piece is the rotating disc that holds and switches the objective lens. So that is a term that you want to be familiar with. You want to know the function of the nose piece. And then you want to understand kind of the general steps that you would take when using the microscope. You want to know what happens to the orientation of the letter E as you view it through the microscope. And what you'll see in the next slide is that the E is upside down and backwards. And that's because of the two lenses that the microscope has. It has the objective lens and the ocular lens. So for this slide, you don't have to memorize which one looks like what. But my point that I wanted to point out here is that you can see that if I look at the letter E when it was right side up on my slide, if I compare that to what I saw under the microscope, I'll notice that the E is both upside down and backwards. You want to know that we call the microscopes parfocal. And what that means is that the microscope stays approximately in focus when switching objective lenses. So again, this is why when we go up in magnification, we only need to adjust the fine focus because our microscope should stay roughly in focus as we increase in magnification. You should know the answer to these three questions. So as magnification increases, what happens to the working distance? What happens to the light intensity? What happens to the size of field of view? And remember that for all of these things, they are all inversely related. As magnification goes up, working distance goes down because the lens gets larger. As magnification goes up, light intensity goes down because again, the lens is, is larger and not as much light is funneled up and into the lens. And then as we go up in magnification, 
our size of field of view goes down because as we're zooming in, we're not seeing as great of a field of view. We're, we're zooming in on one part. So this is what you wanna study from this slide. You want to know what are the different ways that you can adjust the light. So you wanna know that the rheostat is like a dimmer switch and it controls the light. You wanna know that the condenser's job is to gather and focus light to illuminate the specimen. You wanna know that the iris diaphragm is that little lever on the condenser and its job is to control the amount of light that exits the condenser. So you wanna know the various parts, what they do in terms of ways to adjust the light intensity. So this diagram is just showing you where you would use to change these various parts. So the iris diaphragm again is this little lever that goes back and forth on the condenser. And again, its job is to control the amount of light that exits the condenser. And then you wanna know that this is the condenser knob and that is going to move this condenser up or down. You wanna know what is the purpose of the immersion oil. Why do we use immersion oil? And the reason we use immersion oil is that it has an index of refraction that is similar to glass. And what that means is that basically helps to funnel the light up and into the lens. Because again, as we go up in magnification, our lens gets larger, the distance between the lens and the slide is a lot less. And so normally, remember that as we go up in magnification, my light intensity decreases. And so to help with that, when we get to our 100X lens, we use immersion oil. That is gonna help funnel the light up and into the lens. Couple other things you wanna study is you wanna know that when you go up in magnification, don't adjust the course focus, right? Because the course focus moves the stage very quickly. And if you do that, you might snap the slide or the lens because the working distance gets smaller. You also wanna study that once you put oil on the slide, that you do not go back to the 40X lens because the 40X lens is a high dry lens. It's not meant to have oil on it and therefore, once oil's on the slide, we cannot go to the 40X lens. So let's review what you need to know for the simple stain. So you want to know the terms that are underlined or bolded. So what is a stain? What is a chromogen? What is an oxychrome? That's the charged part of the chromogen. You wanna know what the chromophore is. That is the colored portion of the chromogen. So for this one, it's a lot of terms, right? So knowing these different terms, what is a chromogen, oxychrome, chromophore, etc. Now for a simple stain, you wanna know that that is a basic stain. Basic in this case is referring to alkaline. And what that means in terms of pH is that a basic stain is going to accept hydrogen ions from the solution. So it's gonna it's gonna accept these hydrogen ions, and as a result, it's gonna carry a positive charge. You want to understand why do we use a basic stain? And that is that the cell is negatively charged. The positive charge on the chromogen, right? So this basic stain that carries the positive charge is going to be attracted to the negatively charged cell. And therefore, when you use a basic stain, that positive dye is gonna be attracted to the negatively charged cell, and as a result, it's going to stain the cell because opposites attract. You wanna know some examples of basic stains, so some of the ones that we've already looked at, methylene blue, crystal violet, and saffronin. Those last two, crystal violet and saffronin, are used in the gram stain. Malachite green, you will learn later on when we get to our endospore stain. But for now, you can know just the main three that we've already looked at. In terms of your simple stain, you want to know that we did this to visualize a cheek cell, but in terms of the procedures for this, you don't have to memorize the procedure for the simple stain. All right, now moving on to our aseptic technique. So you wanna know what is the term aseptic technique. So to transfer bacteria from one place to another, 
without contaminating ourselves or the culture. You want to know what the term inoculate means. And so inoculate means to introduce microbes into a new environment. You want to know that when we do our aseptic technique that you need this inner cone, this bright blue part here, because the inner cone is the hottest part of the flame. So those are some of the things that you need to know for this slide. You want to know what are the three types of media. So what is the difference between a broth, a slant, and an auger deep? You want to know the difference between a needle and a loop. So be able to identify these two tools. You want to be able to know for each type of media, whether it's a broth, a slant, or a, an auger deep, which tool you should use to inoculate. So notice I color coded them for you. So a loop is used to inoculate both a broth and a slant, but a needle is used to inoculate an auger deep, which is a semi-solid. So you want to know the types of media and then what type of tool you would use to inoculate those various types of media. You want to know some key points in terms of aseptic technique. So again, that you work out in front of you, you don't have your materials right underneath you, that you want to keep your tubes, etc., close to the flame, that's your sterile field. You want to know how you hold the loop, that you hold the loop like a pencil. You want to know that you hold it towards the back of the loop. Now, for this part, you should know the steps of aseptic technique. So some important keys about aseptic technique is that you want to make sure that you label your tube. You want to make sure that when you flame your loop, you start with the base and you work your way towards the loop. The loop is the last part to be flamed because if there is liquid on the loop, it might splatter. So we start at the base and we work our way towards the loop. You want to understand that you should not put the cap down on the desk that you should hold it in your loop hand. The hand that has the loop is where you're gonna put the cap. You can hold it between your pinky and your ring finger, for example. You wanna understand that before you go into any tube, you have to flame the opening of the tube because we don't want contaminants to fall in. So you wanna know that when we go into a tube, we flame the opening of the tube, and we also are going to reflame it after we're done, but before we put the cap on. So we flame it before we go into the tube, we flame it once we go out of the tube. So you wanna understand that idea. You want to understand that if you are inoculating a slant, that you're going to use a zigzag inoculation. Basically, it's like it suggests, you have the zigzag pattern along the slant. And so these are some of the things that you want to understand about how to do your aseptic technique, right? And so some just major um, major steps in the process. So again, flaming the opening of the tube when you go in or out for any tube, that you should flame your loop starting with the base, working towards the loop to prevent splatter, etc. And so you want to have an overview of what to do for aseptic technique. For a streak plate, you want to know what is the purpose of the streak plate, right? And the purpose is to isolate individual colonies of bacteria from a large mixed population. So if I was studying soil bacteria, for example, I could do a streak plate technique because I would want to isolate the individual bacteria so that I can study those bacteria. You wanna have a general idea that the, the way that the streak plate works is that you wanna have less bacteria in each quadrant. So the most bacteria is going to be in quadrant number one, the next most amount of bacteria would be in quadrant two, then quadrant three, and then quadrant four. And the, again, the purpose of this is that we're trying to look for isolated individual colonies. If we see isolation, that would be a good streak plate. If we do not, then we have a problem with our streak plate. So you want to understand, again, some kind of overviews of the streak plate technique. For example, you want to understand that you need to label 
the auger side of your plate, right? Label the auger side of the plate. Why do we label the auger side of the plate? That was discussed in the environmental culture video. And that is that if we were to drop our plates and the lid were to separate from the auger, which contains the bacteria, then we wouldn't know which plate was which. So we always knock or we always label the auger side of the plate. You also want to understand about the fact that we always incubate our plate auger side up. Again, that was discussed in our environmental culture, but it's important to know for this as well. And the reason is, is that we need to incubate our plate auger side up so that any condensation ends up in the, in the lid and not on the auger itself. And so when we're working with our plates, we wanna keep our plates auger side up as much as possible and only flip it auger side down when we're ready to do our streak technique. You wanna know that you need to work with your plate by your flame. You wanna know that when we open our plate, we don't take the lid off and just set it on the desktop. We want to open it like a clamshell and then work inside um, between the lid and the plate itself. You wanna understand the importance of the loop angle that if you don't have your loop angle just right, you're gonna have problems with your streaks. So if your loop is too flat, meaning you're not up high enough, you're gonna end up with very broad streaks because a greater amount of the surface of the loop is touching the auger and you're not gonna get thin streaks. So you have to have your loop up at approximately a 45 degree angle. You don't wanna be too vertical, meaning too far up and down, or you're going to tear the auger. You wanna understand that when you do streaks, that you're going to go from side to side. So if you're right-handed like me, you're gonna go left to right because that's normally how you would write. So you always wanna go across. You never wanna pull your streaks towards you or push them away. We always go side to side when we're doing our streak. You wanna understand that before we go into our broth for a streak plate, that we need to vortex the tube, meaning we need to mix it so that the bacteria is evenly distributed so that we can do our streak plate. You wanna understand the general idea of how we do our streak plate. So again, that you're gonna take one line down, so when you go into the broth using your aseptic technique, you're gonna draw one line down, and then you're gonna go side to side, back and forth, cover this entire area. You need to flame your loop after you streak quadrant number one. Because again, the purpose of our streak plate is to get less and less bacteria in each quadrant. So before I move on to quadrant two, I need to flame my loop and let it cool. And then I'm gonna do my six to eight directional streaks. So again, it's not a zigzag. It's pull from here out, pull from here out, etc. That's quadrant two. When you're done with quadrant two, you would flame your loop, let it cool. Then you're gonna do your six to eight directional streaks going from quadrant two out. So again, six to eight directional streaks. You don't flame between the third and the fourth quadrant. Instead, you simply just take your loop and you pull from quadrant three out, back in, and then you zigzag into the open space without touching quadrant one or two because that would pull too much bacteria back into quadrant four. So you just wanna understand kind of the general idea behind the streak plate so that you understand why it works that way. So for day two, you would just wanna know that if you saw a plate where you can see isolated colonies, where you can see like red colonies separated from white colonies, that would be an example of a good streak plate. Because again, the purpose is to isolate individual colonies of bacteria from a large mixed culture. And so again, the way that we do that is we look to see, do we see isolated colonies? If we do, that's a successful streak plate. It doesn't matter which quadrant the isolation occurs in. It simply matters as far as do you have the isolation. If you do, that's considered a successful streak plate. This would be an example of a 
not so great streak plate, this would be a bad example because you don't see isolated colonies. Notice it's just a big mess of bacteria. And notice that one of the reasons could potentially be maybe that the person dipped into their broth more than once. So this would be a bad example of a streak plate. So this slide is just reviewing, you know, what not to do when you're doing a streak plate. Again, that goes along with what I said earlier. When we get to our culture media, you want to know what is auger. So again, it's a complex polysaccharide. It's derived from seaweed and it's used as a solidifying agent for media that's used in plates, slants, and deep. So anything that's at least a semi-solid is going to contain auger. You want to understand that it's generally not metabolized by microbes, meaning it's not a food source. So even though it's a sugar, it's a sugar that cannot be digested. And so as a result, the auger is not used as a food source for the bacteria. The auger is simply there to act as a solidifying agent. You want to know that it liquefies at about 100 degrees Celsius and that it solidifies or it becomes a solid at about 40 degrees. You want to know what is chemically defined media. And that is that the exact chemical composition um, is known. You want to know that this is used for fastidious organism. And that is what, what that term means. That means that these are organisms that require many growth factors that are provided in chemically defined media. So a fastidious organism is one that has very specific growth requirements. You also should know that chemically defined media is used for microbiological assays. You don't need to know yet the citrate utilization I will explain this one in more detail later. So for this quiz, you can hold off on knowing even that it's used for microbiological assays. For the lab practical, yes, because you'll see what that means later on. But for the first quiz, you don't have to know that. You want to know if you were given a media, you would want to be able to look at that and know if that's chemically defined or undefined. And what you're looking for and what you're going to see on the next slide is that our complex or undefined media basically is going to have ingredients like peptones or pancreatic digestive casein or beef extract or yeast extract, etc. But in chemically defined media, you're not going to have those types of ingredients. You don't have to memorize what's in this media and what each of these ingredients are used for. It's just for you to see an example of what would be found in that media. You want to know what is complex or undefined media. You want to know both of those terms. So don't just study one. You should know both. And that is media that contains extracts and digestive yeast, meat, or plants. And that the chemical composition varies from batch to batch. Meaning when we buy the media, when we buy this ingredient, it basically can have some variability. And so an example of this, nutrient auger. Nutrient auger is going to have beef extract. It has peptones. Both of these ingredients make the media complex or undefined because those can vary from batch to batch. So now we're going to move on to our different stains. So you want to know for the negative stain, what is the purpose? And the purpose is to visualize bacterial cells and determine morphology, arrangement, and accurate cell size. You want to know specifically why it's used for that purpose. And that is that when you do the heat fix and air dry step in a simple stain and a gram stain, that the heat in those procedures may cause the cells to shrink and fragile cell types such as spirochetes may become damaged. And so we use a negative stain if we're trying to visualize spirochetes, which are fragile, or if we're trying to determine accurate cell size, because our negative stain does not use heat. You want to know an example of a negative stain, one that we use specifically would be Congo Red. You want to understand why is the background stained 
in a negative stain. You want to know that the negative stain is an acidic stain. It donates hydrogens to the solution. So that's what an acid does. It donates hydrogens. The stain in a negative stain carries a negative charge. And the negative charge on the stain is repelled by the negatively charged cell. So you want to understand all of that part, that it's an acidic stain, the stain is negative, the cell is negative, the like charges repel. In our simple stain and our gram stain, those are basic stains. They carry a positive charge, and for these stains, they stain the cell. But in a negative stain, it's going to stain the background because the charges on the cell are repelled by the charge on the stain. You want to know this slide. This is going to be important. You're going to see this in uh, lecture and lab. And so you want to understand the different types of morphology. So that spherical is a caucus, a rod is a bacillus, a curved rod, what looks like a comma, is going to be a vibrio. You want to know that a spirillum is a rigid spiral and a spirochete is a flexible spiral. Those are morphology. Those are shapes. You should also know the arrangements. So diplo, di means two. It's two of those cells together. Staphylo refers to grape-like clusters. And strepto refers to chains. Now, staphylo can be staphylococcus, but there isn't staphylobacillus. And that has to do with the way that bacillus divide. They will divide along the horizontal plane, meaning they'll divide out this way. So bacillus can form streptobacillus. They can form chains because they can be, you know, in a row, but they're not going to be in clusters because they don't divide vertically. They only divide horizontally. So you want to know this slide in terms of the names for the different types of morphologies and the names for the different types of the arrangements as well. You want to know an example organism that we would use a negative stain for. So in this example, I talked about Treponema pallidum. You want to know that that is a spirochete, right? It's a flexible spiral, and it causes the sexually transmitted infection, syphilis. I'm not going to ask you all of the different um, stages in syphilis and all the different symptoms, but if I ask you about a negative stain, you should be able to tell me an example of an organism that we would stain a negative stain with, meaning Treponema pallidum would be an example. Another example that's good to know, it won't necessarily be on the quiz because um, I only picked one of the two organisms to put on the quiz, but just in general, you should know Borrelia burgdorferi is the organism that causes Lyme disease and the way that you contract Lyme disease is through the bite of a tick. And one of the hallmarks is going to be this characteristic bullseye rash. So in terms of the stain or the steps in the negative stain, you don't have to memorize all the steps. I would, however, know that one of the things that's different, and this was one of the things in the question set too, is that we only want to use a half drop of Congo Red. We don't want a full drop because a full drop will allow too much of the dye to come out. So we only want to use a half drop. And then we want to know that we don't um, use any heat. There's no heat fixing. There's no um, drying on a slide warmer. When we do this, we just let it air dry on the bench. If you were given an example of a negative stain, so if you were given a diagram like this, and you could see this little white squiggly, you should be able to recognize that this is a negative stain. So the background is stained, but the cell is not. And so you're visualizing a spirochete, which again is gonna be that flexible spiral. So you should be able to recognize this picture on the left. The one on the right, you're not gonna to have to really recognize, but the one on the left is really important because this is when you look at a spirochete. And we use negative stains for spirochetes because there's no heat fix step. And so we don't damage the spirochetes by using this technique. Now, moving on to our capsule stain. Again, the capsule stain is going to take the place of the standard plate count. So this one is in place of the standard plate count. So you want to know for the capsule stain, what is the purpose? 
to differentiate between capsule producing cells and unencapsulated cells. So meaning that this is a differential stain. You want to know the functions of the capsule, so all of these functions. You want to know the composition, so what is the capsule itself actually made of? So that mucoid polysaccharide, which is a carbohydrate or a sugar, or polypeptide, protein-based, it's less common but is used in bacillus anthracis. You, again, will see this also in lecture. For the capsule stain, you should be able to tell me that the cell is stained with safranin. The safranin is going to be our basic stain. It stains the cell. You want to be able to tell me that the background is stained, and that's because we use an acidic or a negative stain like Congo Red, and that the capsule is the clear area. So those clear areas around the cell is the capsule. So you want to be able to know the different parts. The, the capsule is clear. The cell is red because of the safranin. The background is red because of the Congo Red. And so understand that amount of detail in terms of the staining procedure. In the capsule stain, you don't have to memorize the procedure. However, you should know which dyes are used and what part that stains. So again, that the safranin is used to stain the cell, and that's a basic stain, and that the Congo Red, which is an acidic or a negative stain, is used to stain the background while the capsule is the clear part. So again, you don't have to memorize this procedure. You just need to know like I told you in the slide before this. Same thing with this. You don't have to memorize the procedure. You just need to know that we use two stains, that we don't use a heat fix step. Um, and so you just wanna know what the capsule stain will look like. You should be able to identify, not necessarily for the quiz, but for the exam, you should be able to identify that these are examples of a capsule stain. You don't have to distinguish between if you're looking at Klebsiella and ammoniae or if you're looking at Bacillus megatherium. You don't have to make that distinction of which is which, but you should recognize that if you see either of those pictures, that in fact you're looking at a capsule stain. Because again, the background is stained with the Congo Red, the cell is stained with the Safranin, and that clear halo around the cell is going to be the capsule. And so when you're studying for the practicum, you will need to know an example organism, and I believe the one that's on our list is Klebsiella pneumoniae, which causes pneumonia. And then lastly, we have our gram stain. You want to know the purpose of the gram stain, so to stain and differentiate gram-positive versus gram-negative bacteria. You want to know why it's important to do a gram stain. And so in that video, I talked about why it's important to do a gram stain, so to pick the appropriate antibiotic, as well as if you have a gram-negative infection, I talked about why you would choose a particular drug or not. So go back and review what is the reason, so it's not written down, but I did talk about it, what is the reason that we need to know if an infection is caused by a gram-negative or a gram-positive bacteria? And there were two main reasons. So you'll want to go back and, and review that. You want to know that in the gram stain that we use basic dyes to stain the cell. You want to know that we use two dyes. We use crystal violet and we use safranin. You want to understand that at the end of this procedure, gram positive are going to appear purple and gram negative are going to appear pinkish red. And so this would be like an example of what you would see when you guys did this because you took your Citrobacter frundii, which is your gram negative, and you mix it with Staphylococcus epidermidis. And I had, I told you guys that you would mix it in the same puddle of water. And so in that puddle of water, you're going to have both your gram positive and your gram negative. You want to know why gram positive stain differently than gram negative. And that is that the gram positive will retain the purple color, they will retain the crystal violet because it has a thick layer of peptidoglycan. 
So because of this thick layer of peptidoglycan, it's going to hold in that purple crystal violet. Whereas for gram negative, you wanna know that the gram negative has an outer membrane, that it has these LPS, this lipopolysaccharide, which has lipid A, which is an endotoxin. You wanna know that gram negative have porins in their outer membrane. And then again, the big key is gonna be that they have a thin layer of peptidoglycan so that when we decolorize with the acid alcohol solution, the acetone alcohol, when we decolorize because of the thin peptidoglycan and gram negative, you wanna understand that the purple dye is going to come out, that the crystal violet is going to come out, which is why we have to stain with the counter stain, which is gonna be safranin. And so the reason that this stain is differential, it differentiates based on the thickness of the peptidoglycan. Gram positive have a thick peptidoglycan. They will retain their crystal violet. Gram negative has a thin peptidoglycan. They will decolorize and they will stain with the secondary stain, which is the safranin um, in this experiment. And they would appear pink red. You wanna know the overall steps in terms of how to make a heat fix smear. You want to know that when we transfer bacteria to the slide, that we want to use a needle. This is a key, a needle, because we don't want to pick up too much bacteria. You want to know the purpose of the heat fix, and that's on the next slide. So why do we heat fix? You wanna know the three reasons, one of which is the mechanism, meaning the way that this works. So we heat fix to kill the cells, to adhere bacteria to the slide, and the mechanism, and the other reason we heat fix, is that proteins denature and coagulate. So again, that means that the proteins unfold and they stick together. And so that's gonna kill the cells and adhere bacteria to the slides. This is one of the few procedures where you do need to know the steps. You do need to know the steps for this one. So you should know that the primary stain is gonna be the crystal violet that we add for one minute and then we dump and we rinse with deionized water. You wanna know that we add the mordant, in this case it would be the iodine. We add the iodine to the slide, allow it to sit for one minute, dump, and then rinse with deionized water. You want to know that for the decolorization step that you're gonna use an acetone alcohol solution until the solution coming off runs clear. So again, that step is not one minute. It's simply until the liquid coming off is going to be clear. You wanna know that the decolorization step is the most important step in the entire procedure. That this is the part where the stain becomes differential, meaning that this is where gram positive and gram negative become different, is during the decolorization step. You want to know that then you rinse with water and add the secondary stain or what we also call the counter stain which is going to be our safranin we add it for one minute then dump off the safranin and rinse and then we would view our slides under the microscope you want to know that the crystal violet is the primary stain you want to know um, that the iodine is the mordant and you want to know the purpose of the iodine and the purpose of the iodine is that it forms a crystal violet iodine complex, basically meaning that it makes the dye molecules larger so that the crystal violet is retained within the cell. So you wanna understand that when we add crystal violet, that both gram positive and gram negative are purple because they both stain with that basic stain. When we add the iodine, which is the mordant, which helps keep the crystal violet in, that both cell types are still purple, right? Because they still have their crystal violet. But the most important step of the entire procedure is going to be the acetone alcohol. And this is where the stain becomes differential because gram positive have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. They will retain the crystal violet. Gram negative have a thin layer of peptidoglycan and so the crystal violet is going to come out of the cell. And then you wanna know that the last step is the safranin, 
which we call either the counter stain or the secondary stain. It's the second stain that we use. It is still a basic stain, so it still stains the cell. In the case of the gram positive, the safranin still gets in, so it's not that there's no red in the cell. It's just that we don't see it because the purple is darker than the pink. So at the end of the procedure, gram positive would appear purple, gram negative would appear pink red because they became colorless during the decolorization step. But this is why we need the secondary stain because we need to be able to visualize those gram negative bacteria. So this is why we use our secondary stain, which is going to be our safranin. So you want to know for each of these steps, what color gram positive appear, what color gram negative appear, and why. So you should know those different steps. You should know what each of those solutions is used for. So again, the crystal violet is the primary stain. The iodine is the mordant. The acetone alcohol is the decolorizer. And the safranin is going to be your secondary or your counter stain. The other thing that you want to review, and I mentioned this in the video, is I want you to review what does it mean when we say that we over decolorize? What would the cells look like if I over decolorize? And then on the flip side, what would the cells look like if I under decolorize? Meaning that I don't run the decolorizer long enough. So you should be able to tell me why either of those are not good, why you don't want to over decolorize or under decolorize, and how that affects the result. So these are the things that you want to know for your gram stain. This is what I was talking about, how you need an example organism. So if you were given an image that looks like this, where you can see little pink rods, you know that an example organism would be E. coli or Escherichia coli. So E. coli would be an example of a gram-negative rod. Notice that it's pink because it stains with the secondary stain. If you see these little spheres of clusters, right, so these grape-like clusters of little spheres, and they're purple, you're looking at Staphylococcus. And an example of this, Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, those would all be examples, so use the one that's on that first slide when you're studying. But what you should know is you should be able to look at these pictures and say whether it's gram-negative or gram-positive, and then also an example organism um, that would be possibly on the slide. And then lastly, you want to review this slide. So this was a question that's asked at the end of the video. What would each step look like if we accidentally added the safranin first and the crystal violet second? So you would want to be able to kind of describe what colors they would be after each step. And again, we will go over this in our Zoom meeting to talk about the answers, but you're going to want to study this once we go over it. There's a reason that we have to add crystal violet first. So you're going to review this slide once you get your answer. And so this concludes our video on what to study for quiz one.